This is Strategieman. This time with an edit of a live stream I did today on July 1st, 2020 with Eric Schön. Eric Schön is the author of the great book on strategy called The Art of Strategy. It presents his personal view on the combined wisdom and works of Sun Tzu from 500 before Jesus Christ, John Boyd, late 20th century, and currently Simon Wadley, still alive and kicking into it. So Eric compiled all this work into one well thought out, highly conceptual and perfectly executed book, which is my reference on today's position on strategy. Good morning to everyone. I'm really happy. Um, today this is different from what's happening on this channel normally. So normally it's pre-recorded. This is live and normally it's in German. We could do this in German, I guess, but I don't want to put Eric through this. Um, Eric Schön is my guest and um, I know Eric since years actually and he's been into strategy way before me. I saw him talking about it when it still was a myth to me. Like I had a concept about it, but he had talks. Hmm. And now, of course, he also overtook me in writing a book. So this is Eric. And um, this is his book and you saw it before. This is the book, The Art of Strategy. It's combining views of Sun Tzu, Boyd and Wardley. So three pillars of strategy that are discussed today, ranging from Sun Tzu, which was, I think he wrote like 500 years before Chris, Christ, Jesus Christ, and Wardley is still being active. So that is kind of the spectrum you took over with this book. So, hi, good morning, Eric. I was talking a lot about you now, so hi and welcome. How are Thank you, doing? you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. So. Yeah, so maybe for the audience, uh, you're sitting in the office at home or is it at work already? This is the office at home, home office, working from home, um, working really well. Cool. So let's dig right into it. So you wrote this book. It's, it's covering strategy through all the ages from thousands of years ago until today. So also it was a lot of work, I guess, and it's... From my perspective, it's really highly conceptual. You might deny it, but from my point of view, there's lots of lots of thought on how you structure the chapters, on the names of the chapters. It's it's deep stuff. So here's my question. With, with all that stuff and covering all these ages, what was your actual intent on writing the book? And what did you want to accomplish with it? Like, was it just for you? Was it for the world? Was it what drove you? Yeah, it's, it's a great starting question. Uh, I think um, Sun Tzu is, as you said, 2,500 years ago. There are so many patterns there. There's so much wisdom in it. But I always felt lost in translation when reading it, lost in time, lost in space, you know. Uh, so I, I read a lot of translations, and I felt there was always something missing. And when finding Wardley, I realized that it's it's getting new glasses, getting the glasses of a bit modern modern words for for leadership modern words for for way of working modern words for for doing strategy um so so that was one reason uh to to sort of convey and interpret sun tzu all the wisdom regarding how to be certain to succeed uh for like uh, a modern audience then i also felt in in the agile community there was something missing uh over the let's say 10 years that i've been active it's it's the understanding of, of what is strategy and the various misconceptions and and what is this thing business agility L lots of fancy words so i wanted to try to make it a bit more concrete and use use um, a, a concrete language to talk about these things and you know there are there are things like like we know in the agile community and from kanban it's good with with the uh, with the uh, you know adaptability, it's good with uh, with feedback loops. It's good with learning loops. So 
I also discovered some forgotten patterns here uh, that I think are important. So that's that it's it's good to make some kind of assessment. You know, what's the situation we're in? It's good to make preparations. <laughs> that's important. And uh, surprises, positive surprises, are good. And uh, alliances, working with your stakeholders, those are a few things that sort of are important and deserves more more focus and attention. And when it comes to the to the sort of book, I mean, it's I wanted to make it in in a, a few chapters that were quite short and easy to read. So thirteen chapters, five ten minutes reading time. I agree with you that it's, it's a bit conceptual, but still uh, Boyd, Sun Tzu, and Wardley, they are practical, hands on persons. They have done strategy, so they have lived it and done it, uh, and then reflected upon it and talked about it and written about it. So I wanted to to have it in in, in a rather compact format, uh, so you don't have to read three hundred pages or five hundred pages. You know, a couple of chapters, <laughs> and it all started that blog, blog post that were you know five ten minutes reads. Then you can think about them and try them out for for a lifetime. But I would say it's it's rather simple concepts, and you shouldn't overcomplicate strategy because it's it's really about how to, to live and thrive and be successful and be certain to succeed in a world where the rate of change will never be slower than today, which is very relevant yeah. with the COVID thingy. <laughs> and, and finally, I think what I realized also is this is the first uh, written book or a paperback format on, on Wordly Maps. Um, there True. are, of course, Simon's Medium articles. There's some e-books and, and that are really good. Uh, but people ask me, why, when are you going to turn your, your Medium articles into PDF? And will there be a book? And then I thought, okay, let's, let's see what I can do. Let's, <laughs> let's make it into a book. So that's <laughs> what I did. So why the three? There's like millions out there. Not millions, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. thousands probably. Mm -hmm. So you choose exactly three. And three is a great number, a magical number. So it's clear that it's going to be three. But why exactly those? Mm. Well, I think uh, they are on my top five list. To be honest, uh, there are a couple of more that are, are really <laughs> good. Um, but what I what I realized is that, as I as I said just before, that they these three persons are practitioners. They have been doing it. They have been hands on doing it. And not only that, they have been reflecting. They've been talking. They've been teaching. And also writing about it, and I think that combination is is really really good. And there there are so many patterns in there, and and they're all building upon each other. Of course, uh, John Boyd in in the late 20th century is sort of translating uh, Sun Tzu into to the sort of military world of, of the second half of the 20th century about you know how to succeed in in a, in a global strategic landscape. And wardly adding the, the visualization, but they're all building upon each other. They're standing on the shoulders of each other, sort of three giants, <laughs> which makes a triple giant, sort of. <laughs> um, so, so it's it's about learning from the best, really, uh, and and trying to to put that in a nice compact format, which is sort of complete without being, you know, encyclopedic, <laughs> if, if mm. you see what I mean. So, um, I think that's. Sort of the they are connected and they are you know practitioners and um, they were influenced by by each other so i have a hunch that this also has something to do with the work you're doing so is is your interest and the choice because you talk about practitioners and pragmatism is, is that also connected to what serves you Good point. I mean, I've been doing strategy on and off for the past 20 years, you know, in startups, scale-ups, and in large corporations, uh, both creation of strategy, creating it, and making it happen. And there are various challenges in, in that. So I can I can relate to sort of the struggles and the challenges that, that you can uh, sense and, and uh, feel and see in, in, uh, in the books uh, by, by Wardley and, and Boyd and Sun Tzu. So, so I can really relate to it, and, and it resonates with me uh, as being a practitioner myself. I mean, trying to be, be successful in, in what I do. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, strategy is important because you need to make the choices. You need to, to have your purpose and, and your direction um, to start with, for instance. So you've been talking about that some of the core ideas 
are actually not too complicated. Um, I always try to find the easy start for things, even though things are sometimes not that easy. And we've been talking about that before, how actually what they do is more describe than analyze. And um, I always compare that to Bushnell's law. So Bushnell is the founder of Atari. And what he said is when you start a video game, the start has to be easy and engaging, but mastery has to take ages. And it seems to me that you're looking for a similar approach to make things approachable and accessible and kind of democratize access to these resources. Yeah, I think so. I, I, and maybe that's it's always difficult to generalize, but I think it, it's for me, it's a little bit of a German thing. I studied in Hamburg for half a year and I have... <laughs> I have family living in Hamburg, even though my name is Those German. Germans. I, have, I have, I have, I have no no relationships <laughs> in that way. But you know, woran kommt es eigentlich an? I mean, what's the essence of, of of the thing? Getting to the essence of things that's super important. And and then of course instantiated, coming up with examples and the concrete cases and so on and so forth. But really, uh, finding the the essence is super important. And going back to Sun Tzu, I think uh, for me, it's it's Assess, prepare, influence, surprise, adapt, repeat. That's all. Hmm. That's what you do. And then you can say, well, it's the OODA loop with the observe, orient, decide, act. You can have the strategy cycle from Wardley. Um, all these things. But, but in essence, it's, it's about these things. And it's about making choices. Um, what to do and what not to do. Having a purpose. Um, that can change, but not as often as, as your choices and your decisions and your actions and your initiatives. One thing I found is that the easier the idea seems, the harder it is it's often to pull off. Like, for example, when I'm talking about different levels in my model, and you have to couple them, that's obvious. Doing it is culturally actually hard. And I think lots of your book is about simple ideas that are hard to pull off. True, true. And uh, as all uh, important and interesting things in life, they, they are not always easy. There, there's an element mm -hmm. of getting into the habit of trying it out and doing it and doing it together. I mean, at the whiteboard drawing, that's a fantastic way uh, of, of doing things, including strategy. And that's, that's what I like with the, with the worldly mapping. That was a revelation to me. Um, when a way of visualizing strategy in the same way as you have maps for, for taking you from A to B, uh, when you're going in the real world, uh, a map helping you go from A to B in, in your technology landscape or your business landscape, uh, is, is a fantastically beautiful and powerful tool. So, when you chose those three strategies, what were things which bridge them that they have in common from your perspective? Mm -hmm. As I said, they're all practitioners. Um, they are all uh, about conversations, I would say, and about, I think it's about doing things together, maybe more with the... With, uh, with Boyd and with Wardley, and of course, um, this element of situational aw awareness, um, what is your context, always be present in the here and now, um, and trying to share that context, um, I think that's that's important. And I think also the importance of leadership, then, then um, we can debate and discuss if the leadership of Sun Tzu is, is the same as, as the leadership of, of favored by Boyd and by, by, uh, by Wardley, but leadership um, is, is important, uh, is an important aspect. And uh, I happen to think that that doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big general <laughs> uh, or, or, a, or an emperor. Uh, it can be seen more of as, as a service that everyone can provide. Um, depending on what is needed by the team or by the organization. So, so leadership as a service, um, something that I, I've seen work really well. And it's not exclusive to, to the formal roles, be it an emperor or, or a manager or, or a product owner. 
Okay, Eric, this is what they have in common, but how do they differ? How do they differentiate? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, Boyd and Sun Tzu are more conversational. The, I mean, Boyd even called his, his work the discourse, which is a conversation or a dialogue. And, and I feel that, that uh, Sun Tzu is also a very much conversational or, or like spoken, <laughs> so to speak, whereas Wardley adds this element of, of visualization with the Wardley maps where you can actually see your, your strategy, um, see how the technology evolves uh, in different evolutionary stages and that will help you to to make the decisions and make your choices of, of where to sort of attack or defend or outsource or or do it yourself or or buy so so i think that's that's of course a difference but there, there are very many similarities and of course they they are sort of building upon each other over time and, and the, the, the sort of wisdom and, and experience is, is accumulating. But another obvious uh, difference is, of course, that Sun Tzu and, and Boyd were primarily in a military context. So, so Wardley adds the, the business landscape, the business um, aspects of things. Many approaches actually require a Renaissance man who is really good at lots of things. And I read something to people from your book, which is from Sun Tzu. And it's when assessing conditions and making comparisons, ask who has more influential purpose, who has more skilled leadership, who is favored by landscape and climate, who carries out doctrine more skillfully, who has more capabilities, who has more highly trained people, who provides feedback more clearly. This shows who will succeed and who will fail. Attract and retain people who use these factors and be certain to succeed. Dismiss people who do not or be certain to fail. So it seems strategy needs incredible wisdom. Like, I mean, if I have all this, it's easy, isn't it? Like, but is, is there like a more approachable answer rather than be the smartest guy on the planet? <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, I can re reassure you, you, do, you don't need to wait for the next Napoleon. You don't need to wait for the next Julius Caesar. Um, you don't even need to wait for the next uh, Karl von Clausewitz. Um, it, I think it's a team effort. Um, um, and that's why I consciously in the, this interpretation wrote people, because people it all starts with people, right? And if you have um, a team of people with different perspectives and, and you know diversity in all kinds of dimensions and, and you create a safe space and, and um, um, where you can get sort of the inclusion of all those perspectives, get them out on the table or get them out on the whiteboard um, by drawing a map, for instance, I think that's where the magic happens. Um, so it's not about a single superhero with all superpowers that you can conceivably think of it's about each and every one of us having a, a few few superpowers and and working together to become a, a league of a league of <laughs> heroes or league of legends uh, that that can can work together and and um, you know work on the uh, strategy challenge each other in a friendly way um, make those choices and challenge those choices um, and then of course making it happen by by providing the direction and the purpose for everyone in the organization and hopefully that will help everyone to take the right decisions take the right actions take the right initiatives because they know this is the direction we're going this is the overall choices this is um, you know how i can contribute in the here and now in the moment yeah and i mean um this channel is called Strategie machen, so it's about doing strategy. So whatever happens, I think the first thing is just doing it because truth is in doing it and thinking and doing always needs to be in close lockstep. So it's like most organizations think a lot, but don't just do and don't enable enough people to do it. And kind of it's often kind of an excluding culture. And I think, again, that's something you address with making all these ideas really approachable in your book. Yeah, and that's where I think the visualization is so important. And 
that's a way of giving context. That's a way of giving the situational awareness to not a, an exclusive <laughs> a bunch of people in the in the C suite, you know, the executive suite, um, but making it more um, well for everyone everywhere in the organization. And that gives you a lot of speed. It gives you a lot of innovation, and it gives you a lot of engagement and motivation as well. So these are three things that most organizations struggle with. And, and by, by having clarity and, uh, on, on your choices and your direction and your purpose, um, and then complementing that with the situation and awareness of the context, given the context, that, that will unleash a lot of creativity because we have so many skilled, experienced people. You know, I, I, I sometimes talk about uh, creative smart creative collaborators i think google talks about smart creatives but i would like to add smart creative mm -hmm. collaborators because if mm -hmm. you cannot collaborate if you do not collaborate you know that will be hard yeah <laughs> so let's let's dig a little bit deeper into the content so one of the essential concepts you wrote write about in your book and of course the thing that john boyd came up with is um the ooda loop and Maybe a little story up front. Like, um, I think the first contact we had was on Twitter. And it was like when Twitter was still Twitter and you were sitting, um, I don't know, in front of the TV, having ideas, throwing them out and getting feedback. And I think I don't actually know if you watched soccer that night or if we just talked about it, but it was about Pep Guardiola's football having to do with the Uda loop and lots of what Sun Tzu is saying. Um, and I want to go towards the Uda loop. So can you give us, while people are seeing an image of the basic concept of observe, orient, decide, and act, like what the Uda loop basically is and how John Boyd uses it, like the, the essentials. Well, Sure, sure. I mean, observe. Obviously, you need to look at what, what is happening around you in the world. That's where it all starts. Um, then I think the second part, the orientation part, the orient part is super important because that's where you make sense of all your observations. And that's, of course, dependent upon your some, some parts genetic, some part your, your uh, upbringing, uh, your, your social context, um, whatever biases you have or, or, or don't have. So, so that's really, um, uh, well, the, 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 the core of, of the loop. Then, of course, based on that orientation, um, you will make decisions. Um, you can call them hypothesis that you would like to test or try out. And then, of course, the act uh, is, you know, Do it. Do what you decided, <laughs> or test test your hypothesis. Make your experiments in order to learn and, and improve. And I think what happens here is is like a control system uh, in the control theory sense uh, that you have a little loop here. <laughs> There's various <laughs> feed, feed forward loops and feedback loops. But in essence, it, it's based on your your learnings. You will update your orientation based on your observations. You will update your orientation, and sometimes you get very surprised. Oh shit! Pardon my French. What what happened here? And then you really need to to sort of uh, you can call it learning or, or you can call it experience, but that's where you sort of evolve your your orientation. So so you get this um, uh, fingerspitzengefühl, <laughs> as 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 you would say in German. I think gut feel is is the English term, um, but that's based on on this OODA loop, I would say, which is. It's partly a loop, but it's not really a loop because you have all kinds of <laughs> feed forwards and feedback loops. But, but let's let's not go into all those details. But it's it's in essence it's it's a learning loop for updating your your sense making ability uh, of the world, and that you can do as an individual. You can uh, train an AI system based on these methods. You can do it as a team. You can do it as an organization. So it's fractal. Um, And that's the beauty of it. You can use it for, for military strategy. You can use it for politics. Um, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world, there's a lot of inspiration from, mm -hmm. from, uh, from the OODA loop, uh, both in the US and in the UK and in Russia and in China these days with the politicians. So if you want to make better sense of what's going on with the, with the influence and, and the shaping and, and those things, 
the OODA loop is, is, uh, gives you some, some understanding of those things. And I think with the example you brought up, we might see that also the OODA loop can be used for good and bad. I mean, from a, I don't really want to go very deep in there, but I think maybe what Trump is doing is foolishly OODA looping people because basically what he's doing is he's destroying order in his way by by simply kind of ruining concepts that are there so that, for example, he's this is how he dominates the news cycle. This is how he dominates the conversations that are going on. And I think it's by intuition, really. And he had a great guy like Steve Ben, who has, I guess, some deep understanding of, of strategy in the background. So, again, it's just a tool. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, as all tools, they can be used for good and for bad. And, and in this case, it's about messing with people's orientation. Yeah, that's what is going on. True. That's a very good explanation. So let's look for a better example, maybe. So when, yeah. <laughs> when we had fun about, like when we had fun about Pep Guardiola, maybe you can give a short explanation how he's using UDA and, and the other concept of Sun Tzu is basically also robbing the opponent's team of orientation? Yeah, um, I think when it comes to football, um, uh, as the best teams, they, they are... Uh, and you have to know, this is one of Eric's pastimes. That's what he's doing when he's not working. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm a practitioner when it comes to football <laughs> as well. But I'm just a goalkeeper. And, you know, the goalkeeper is always the, the most stupid guy on the team. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be standing in the goal, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but then uh, as a goalkeeper, you can always see the whole field at the same time. So probably uh, the goalkeeper has the best uh, situational awareness and the best knowledge of the context. Uh, but coming back to Pep Guardiola, uh, the, the great, uh, I think the German, the, the Mannschaft is, is, is a fantastic team that is continuing the, the, the spirit of, of Pep Guardiola and even from, from Total Football, which was actually originally invented in, in, in Holland. But now Germany is the, the best team practicing it, I would say. Um, but coming back to what, what, what does that have to do with the OODA loop? Well, of course, um, The, the, the coach and the trainer um, has some ideas on, on how to be unpredictable um, and do the su positively surprising for your fans and, and the negatively surprising for the opponent team. And uh, having a direction, uh, but also updating it all the time <laughs> with, with this kind of loop uh, where, where you change your orientation as a team Of course, in the, each individual updates his or her um, orientation all the time. But also as a team, you have an orientation. You have uh, made those choices on, on how you want to play the game. And uh, you have a purpose. I mean, you have your, your overall game plan, which in, in the sense of, of, um, um, of these teams that we talked about is it's about short passing game and a lot of movement, not standing still. And uh, always, you know, keeping the opponent on the defense, so to speak, both mentally and on the field, because they don't know what's up next. Um, so Orient seems to be special in the whole concept. It's it's different. There's even in the original image, there's lots of concepts in the Orient. Mm -hmm. So can you go more in depth about Orient because it seems so different from all the other things? Yeah, I mean, that's the basic sense-making uh, mechanism, uh, how to make sense of your observations and how to make sense of the results of your experiments. So, and you're formed through your upbringing, you're, you're formed through your, your sort of genetic uh, heritage, I mean, your parents and your family belongings, um, but also from, from the current context that you're in, the, 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 the people you interact with, your team, um, so you're influenced by, by them as well. Um, and you need to update your orientation based on, on observations and based on experience. So, so that's super important. And for me, it's also coming back to this team thing. If you are a team of people, be it a football team or a leadership team or a development team, if you can get a sort of shared orientation where you 
based on your, I mean, uh, diverse team, the beauty of a diverse team. Why is that important? Because if you have a diverse team, you have different perspectives. You have different upbringings, different backgrounds, diversity in all kinds of dimensions. That will complement each other's um, orientation and you get a, a more complete, it can never be totally complete, of course, but you get a, a much, much better understanding of the current situation, a better situation of awareness, a better understanding of your context because you are a team, you have diversity, you have uh, something to share, the, the, the different perspectives like uh, visualization, it could be a Kanban board if you're doing development, it could be a Wordly map if you're doing strategy. So I think that's why warrior orientation is so important and that's why why we need to to help ourselves orient by by a kanban board for for the team or a kanban board for the or, uh, for the whole organization where you see see how things move um, uh, and for strategy the same thing with the warrior map you see how technology evolves and how the business landscape is is looking and that will help you to have the right conversations and make the right decisions and make the right uh, you know, experiments and take the right actions. Um, so, what about if there is no not enough explicit knowledge about cultural transitions, genetic heritage, so that there is no standpoint? What do you do? Then you're in trouble. <laughs> then, uh, because orientation is so important. Uh, then, then. This this monoculture with with people thinking a lot and, and um, not not uh, you know daring to challenge each other because you don't have a safe environment that's a recipe for disaster I think um, because you will run off the cliff um, you won't be able to sense those those um, uh, black swans and you won't mm. be able to sustainably thrive as, as, as an individual or as a team or as an organization. You, you, you want to pick those signals, those weak signals up early. Um, that's super important. And that's why you need those mavericks <laughs> or huh. people with, 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 with different perspectives uh, on, in your organization and in your team. And I think that's, that's very clear from, from both um, uh, Boyd and from, uh, from Wardley, not as clear in Sun Tzu. Um, yeah, and I think this is where all the popular concept like the North Star and, and all this comes from like what are the long-term aims, goals, intents and so on because without that nothing makes sense and nothing can be evaluated, evaluated, prioritized and so mm -hmm. on. I think that's kind of and that's also culminating in Orient because that's where we get orientation of course that's where the name mm -hmm. comes from so I guess mm -hmm. what it's yeah, about. That, that And then and, and sort of in the, in the Agile community, we, we've been talking a lot about being Agile in the sense of being adaptable, um, which is important, of course. Um, but there's this extended adaptability, if you will, that even if you're successful, having the ability to break out of those successful patterns, success patterns that made you successful before it's too late, because the world might be changing. And that's where orientation and situational awareness comes in and becomes so important because if you're missing some pieces in your orientation uh, you might still get locked in your your um, groove so to speak and you won't get out of it before it's too late and that's because the, your orientation is, is not as good as it could be hmm. Jabe always Jay Bloom always expresses this as Agile has always been more on the tactical side and like where it came from. And then if we want to transfer it to like larger organizations, we need to take care that the long-term orientation is not lost because we're giving short-term tactics, which are great, so much power and also decision power because we want decentralized decisions that we have to make actually more work on the strategic side and all the glue between the decentralized powerful teams and so on exactly and that's why we need to convey uh, work together on this this uh, orientation part uh, because you can call it the big picture you can call it the context you can call it situational awareness uh, but that's sort of the foundation for your decisions and your actions and your initiatives 
And the better your orientation, the, the better your situational awareness, the better your context or understanding of the context, the, the better the quality of those decisions and act actions and initiatives on all levels. I mean, having a, a bigger organization, you will have different levels or you can talk about closer to the customer or far more far away from the customer. But, but all these all these areas require a lot of context and that doesn't come for free. It, it's an investment and it takes some time to, to, to give that context. And that's why visualization is so important. And then we're back to Kanban boards or Wordly maps. So going further, in comes Simon, enters the stage from the right, and he's basically using all the stuff of Sun Tzu. He's also using all the stuff by John Boyd, but he's adding something really new, which is visualization of concepts, coming up with maps where position has meaning and semantics and makes for a great communication tool. So. I think that's why I also chose him. Also, he's still alive and doing it. So that's another advantage. So um, can you go in depth on how you got to learn the stuff that Simon does and how it helped you and, and what it means to you? Yeah, uh, this was really a revelation uh, because having worked with strategy on and off, I mean, creating it and making it happen, for the past 20 years in, in different organizations, I was always missing something. And you don't know what is missing until you see it, right? And, and <laughs> having a visualization, it's like, you know, before you had geographical maps, how did you how did you travel it? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> not possible to understand. You had you had stories, right? Yeah, you, you go to, to, to Iceland and then you turn to the left if you want to get to North America. Uh, it, may, it sounds silly when, when you explain it. And... Uh, These days, you would always like to have a geographical map, because otherwise you get lost. And it's the same thing with, with the Wordly Maps for Strategy. It's a way of avoiding getting lost. And it will help you to, to see things more clearly. Uh, it sort of stares at you when you see, okay, this technology is sort of totally new. Okay, should we work on that? Or should we do the things that is totally commodity? Where should we spend our efforts? And if you have it visually staring it in your face, it's so much easier to realize, hey, this commodity thing, why do we spend a lot of money doing that? Well, we could invest that in doing something new, which no one else is doing. So working with the maps, uh, drawing the maps together uh, in the business setting is totally awesome. <laughs> and. and <laughs> Doing it together as a team, you learn so much uh, by doing it. So you learn by doing uh, the, the, the visualization. And you, you can start challenging each other. And uh, is this the right choice? Or should, is that technology component, is it a commodity? Or is it a product? Or is it a transition? Okay, how should we play the game then um, with what we are doing? So it helps you to have a conversation. And it helps you to also get the orientation right as we mm. talked about before so so uh, once again a true re revelation and uh, you know finally after 2500 years uh, <laughs> we could be more than footnotes to to so, so we could we could add sort of a, a new really important thing which is the visualization of the strategy cool we actually have um an audience question in continuation wow. of this one. So wow. interaction is going on. Yeah. So we, here's a question, a question from Ralph, which I actually personally know. Regarding big picture, I ask myself how to deal with conflicts between leaders and strong people inside your team. How does Sun Tzu distinct between useful irritation and useless obstruction? Hmm. Very good question. Um, how would Sun, Sun Tzu do that? Um, Very, very good question. I think he would he would listen. He would listen very carefully. Mm, um, and then make up his mind. I think it's more interesting to think about what would Boyd have done and what would Wardley have uh, Simon Wardley have done. Simon, we can always ask. <laughs> <He> can, <laughs> we can ask him on Twitter. He will probably answer. Uh, that's a great idea. But, but if, if, 
Yeah, uh, if I may speculate, I think uh, Boyd definitely he wanted the Mag- Mavericks. He wanted the Mavericks on the team. Mm. Um, Sun Tzu, he would probably have said, as long as the person would would sort of be following the, the, the those general concepts of, of you know assessing, preparing, uh, influencing, surprising, uh, if, if that person would be on board on, on that level and sort of have shown that he was doing that then he would definitely listen. Um, I think you, you probably would have earned, need to earn the respect. <laughs> um, but how do we handle this generally? I mean, maps are good. Draw the map uh, uh. together. I mean, start, start from a whiteboard, a white whiteboard, and draw it together. And, and then have a conversation around that. Because these days, there's so much about... Um, the narrative and who owns the narrative and who's the best rhetorically speaking person, uh, which is not bad. Um, but sometimes it's it's the, the extroverts that own the room that gets gets to sort of hold the space and take the space and, and sort of gets their will. And that's not always the right thing that comes out of that. So that's why it's so important with with the maps that, and, and that you let the diversity be included in the room and on the map. Um, so, so that would be my kind of thinking, that, that you have a safe environment where you can challenge each other in a friendly way um, about a physical object. So it's not about me winning over you in the in the mm. argument, but rather, okay, how do we make the best possible map of, of the strategy and the reality that we, we face together? They, at, at Pixar, they had this metaphor that in the end, the patient has to be healthier when he exits the operation theater. So it's it doesn't matter if the medical doctor was right or not. It matters that the patient is healthy. And I think um, what Ralf is talking about is really super tricky because what might look like obstruction might be the most valuable hint you get and vice versa. So a little story of my early career is that there was basically a prick in in the teams we had at the time. So the first company I was working at. And everybody hated and despised him. And out of a certain way of my upbringing, I saw something in him. I said, I take him up into my team. I was really proud. I get along with him for maybe three months. When I realized, well, I'm the prick. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was actually cheating on everyone, but I didn't see it. So this fine line between obstruction and you have to re- have to have um, opponents' opinions in your room as well, versus being really just renitent, just opposing all the time. And I'm I'm a sucker for people opposing. So that's what I saw in him. But then it was baseless. So and, and I think to find that out needs lots of interaction and that's again where you said maps come in that that can bring value to discussion rather than just opinions being exchanged and w- one more thing that when i think a bit more about it it's and this is not sun tzu or border worldly this is uh, another strategist on my top five list this is roger uh-huh. martin and and he has this jedi trick where 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 you ask someone this is like martial arts right so what would have to be true for you to believe in <laughs> in something, if someone is opposing or obstructing something that the rest of the people might feel this is the right thing, you can ask the person who is perceivably obstructing. He or she may have uh, an insight that no one else is seeing. But by by turning the conversation into what would have to be true for you to believe in what we say, then that person would list a number of hidden assumptions. And then you can start prioritizing those assumptions and make experiments, coming back to the decide and act. I mean, hypothesis that you can actually try out, and you get out of this deadlock um, by by doing something concretely about it. So that's another way, in addition to the visualization using Worley maps, by, by doing experiments to find out. And I think that's really a big one. So we had Matthew May on the podcast on mm. this. And he was working with Roger L. Martin, so he came up with also a canvas for that stuff. Mm, mm. And so I was I was a little bit in disdain about canvases until I met Matt. And when I saw this canvas, 
since then I'm using it as one of my main facilitation tools with opinionated people mm. because what I can basically do is say, okay, that's what you think. You realize it's an assumption. So, no, it's not an assumption. I, I'm pretty certain it's true. So, okay, let's assume for a second it's an assumption. We just pin it on this canvas as an assumption. So, how sure are we? Is it more to the left? Not that sure or more to the right? Really sure about things. And then he might be really sure, but the rest of the team is like, no way, this, this can't be true. Or we, we just don't know. And now it's actionable because as an organization, we now know we're not sure about this. It's really important, but we're really uncertain as an organization, whatever this big opinion is. And this is how opinions and opposing opinions can be really something which is rather than stopping us, get us into action to find out the truth. And that's something that was a gem to me. And it's great that you put it up because if we had nothing else in the stream, I think this is kind of one in a million already. <laughs> so here's the thing, a little chance first. So you don't know too much about my model with markers. You just know about the joke with markers and options and uh, work. So in my model, markers are the thing which differentiate us, which describe our identity. So we could be the most pragmatic company, the most future looking company, the most intentional company, who cares? I don't know. Um, and this is, I think, where this orientation comes from in Orient normally. So I think there's a parallel in this. And how I am using it is as stability. So I'm using the level of markers as providing stability to the company. Like, is that something, I mean, you wrote hundreds of pages about this stuff now, is that something where you can, I don't know, cling to, have thoughts about it, opposing thoughts, whatever? Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean I, I I listened to your your talk on on the one hundred agile. I think it was really really good, really really valuable. I found a lot of insights in it. So I'm starting to to understand the model, and I really like it. I try to make make a simple mapping. So so it's like something around purpose, uh, mm -hmm. something around choices, something around doctrine. To use other words um, mm -hmm. that are used by by Wardley uh, and uh, and so on. But uh, coming back to your question, I think the this OODA loop, the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, um, is relevant in all these areas. Um, it's just different time uh, time spans or, or durations because your markers are stable, but you may need to change them. Not maybe every five years or every ten years, but still you need to be be uh, flexible there as well based on your or your orientation and your new insights and your observations of what other your competitors are doing for instance but that's a much much slower loop then yeah <laughs> whereas for your choices that could be different loop times for different parts of the organizations depending on your closer to customers or more far away from your customers and the same thing with the work or, or with the doctrine, your ways of working, that could also be need to be changing. And it could be dependent on where your technology is in, in the technology and business landscape from, from the world map. If, if it's more a totally new thing, you may work in a certain way. If it's more of a commodity product, you can work in another way. So those kind of changes um, are needed uh, in all these three areas, and uh, you need the the loop uh, on different time scales, so to speak. So that's that's my thinking on on that. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, to me, absolutely. So I I honestly think that it's um, basically what I try to do is describe different levels of speed. So in other talks, I used pace layering by Stuart Brand to make that apparent. And then the problem is that these layers of speeds get often institutionalized in companies and siloed. 
which is a natural thing to happen. So all I try to do is is to weakly couple them again so that they're not totally disconnected. And kind of what I don't try to do is like um, align them in a way of slow should get faster and fast should get slower because that would kind of destroy the qualities that are necessary. And I think it's just a different viewpoint on basically the same things that exist. So all of these models make sense. It tries, it depends on how you want to use them. So how I make use of my model is again, um, the Bushnell's law. Like I want to get people talk about the right levels immediately and say, oh, we didn't ever care about the markers and options that much. They're not clear to anyone. So we need to make them more explicit. So I get into the right conversation immediately. So that's where it comes from, more or less. And that's what I really like with, with, with your model and the talk, that, that you sort of make that synchronization or harmonization happening uh, across the, the different people working on different timescales, because that's so important, because then you get the orientation and you get the situational awareness shared across, uh, and that will increase the quality of, of the decisions and the actions taken, because you get a more complete picture of, of the world that way. Yeah, and as we said before, like lots of simple th or things that seem simple can be hard to pull off. And the hard part or the part that is hard to pull off in the model is that um, creating the empathy between the different speeds, because normally, mm -hmm. you know, the guy on on the computer screen doesn't see the CO every day. So they're disconnected mm -hmm. somehow. So and it's easy to blame the other party for mm. stupid stuff that's going on. So mm. getting them more in contact, more understanding, because there's more exchange in light way without interfering with their lives, is um, mm. is these small meetings I set up to gain empathy more or less through habits and stuff mm. like that. So I, I think that's no, but I, I can give you a couple of concrete examples that might yeah. be helpful at this point. Cool. Um, for example, Scania, the, the Swedish truck maker, they have this, they call it real-time management originally. I think they changed the name, but never mind. It's it's about, um, it's like stand-ups um, you do it on your team, um, but then you do it in all the teams all the way up to the CTO. Yeah. And you do them once a day, starting from, let's say, 8 o'clock and then 8 to 8.15. It's the development team. Mm -hmm. 8.15 or slightly later, another 15-minute slot where, where the leadership team for those teams meet and it's deviations handling okay we we have houston we have a problem yeah, let's cool. fix it while it's a small problem rather than waiting several weeks until it's a big problem so within i think it's one and a half hours you could pop potential problems and hopefully resolve them in, by having the right people talking to each other um within within one and a half hours all the way up to the cto um and if you can't solve it you can you have 24 hours until the next day to come up with a proposal for how to resolve it but normally you fix it because at the right level so to speak with the yeah. right people are that needs to talk and when we saw that in action we were a team from my company at the time which was Ericsson we realized that hey this would have taken us 3 weeks to get the same people in the room because everyone is so busy with with other things yeah so that's one concrete example of, of getting a good situational awareness updated for the operational or work things on, on a daily cadence, then you could work on strategy and, and targets um, maybe on a quarterly cadence because mm. it's the rhythm and the cadence that is important, right. not necessarily the speed. And, um, you know, quarterly cadence for, for looking at, at targets um, and potentially strategy updates as well. Um, that's another... Uh, way of doing it where you have your, your leadership team and you invite people to that uh, th those sessions that, that are quarterly where, where you reflect on what you have learned you, you, you do like a strategy retrospective or a strategy prospective because yeah. you want to have an element of proactivity as well so that's another concrete example of what you can do so yeah what I like about how you describe things is there's millions of ways to do it it's not like you have to follow this meeting format or that, like, you know, like back in the ages, they had already four disciplines of execution. Mm. 
mm. and it's great. It's it's mm. just the same thing. Mm. And I'm still hesitating and giving people this. This is how you do it. Like yeah. this is how you glue the company back mm. together and all that mm. stuff. Because there can be so many great, creative, authentic yes. ways of doing it. And I rather go for the mindset, whatever that may be. Like, mm. yeah, we need to have all this conversation all of the time because that's how trust is building, how empathy mm. is building. Mm. how we figure out what needs to be decided by others, what can be decided by me, and mm. like when do I go up the chain and all that stuff. Mm. It, it can be done all the time in those mm. meetings. So that's what I like about it. Yeah, and, and you said something important. It can be done. And, and that's why I threw out these examples. Because, you know, if, if a company like, like Scania with 30,000 people uh, can do it, then, of course, any company can do it if they want to. Right. Should should they do it the same way? No, no, I totally agree with you. But you remove this alibi saying, no, it can't be done. Well, yes, it can. <laughs> right. So, last question for today. And, uh, I mean, I guess people could observe there's more to talk about. I guess we will. Like, in the preparation of this, we had ideas already of how, how we can continue. But my crucial question is right now, after writing the book, will you write another book or is it just enough? <laughs> yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, maybe. It's a good question. Um, nothing at the moment. Uh, I'm, 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 I think now uh, it's, it's good to have these kind of conversations that we have now because that gives new perspectives to me <laughs> that I haven't thought of, <laughs> which is great. So, so, so I, I'm learning a lot from, from, uh, from you and, and the questions here and I'm looking into your model. So, so uh, I like learning things. Uh, that, that's what drives me, uh, trying things. So, so I'm in that phase right now. I mean, doing it, trying it, learning more, getting feedback, having conversations, you know, with people on Twitter, uh, around the book, uh, you know, with companies that are interested, um, with the, with the conferences and, and whatnot. So, so th that's the phase I'm in right now. Will there be another book? It's, it's too early to tell. I mean, mm. it's probably like when you build a house. The, the, the first house you build is for your enemies. The second house <laughs> is for your friends, and the third house is for yourself. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same with books. I, I'm, mm. I'm very, I'm very happy with 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 a book. Uh, of course, um, it's it's like a, a baby. In a sense, um, and, and now uh, I hope it can can grow and, and help people um, do strategy uh, in a better way. Yeah, and you already have it in the back of you. So here's the book. Go get it. So I will make all the details of the book available in the comments of of this thing we're doing here. And um, well. It remains to be said, thanks for taking the time. Hope to see you again soon. And um, also lots for all the discussions we had over the years in the background. Not too public, <laughs> just on Twitter. And... Um, vielen Dank, Markus. Wiedersehen. Oh, yeah. Vielen Dank und auf Wiedersehen. Those Swedes again. Yeah, those Swedes again. And those yeah. Germans again. <laughs> yeah, right. So, thanks a lot. And thanks also to the audience. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.